Hakima is a new forum that brings together Africa's greatest minds with development advocates from across the continent and beyond. And I encourage everybody who's joined us uh, to type your questions or your comments into the box on the right of the screen. Now, the series is brought to you by the African Influencers for Development. This is the UNDP's Regional Bureau for Africa's Partnership Initiative, and it brings together African leaders in business, academia, and the arts together to co-discover and co-implement innovative African solutions for African development. Hakima means wisdom in Swahili, and over the next few months, RBA will host several conversations on how the continent can recover from the effects of COVID-19 and indeed seize the opportunity to find new ideas and solutions that will shape a more prosperous and inclusive Africa. Now, like a tsunami, COVID-19 has swept across the world and it's caused economic damage and it's laid bare the limits of the structures of our societies in Africa. Lives and livelihoods have been lost and weak governance and healthcare structures have been exposed. Social inequality uh, has been laid bare. Now, this is the first ever Hakima discussion, and it asks a very simple but powerful question. How do we seize the opportunity to create a more equitable, resilient, and just Africa after COVID-19? As a great person once said, never waste a good crisis. Now, introduce him. He knows uh, his, own, uh, uh, his own CV, so... I'll go through that. As you can see, our guest today uh, is considered by many uh, to be the greatest uh, living author in Africa. Uh, Professor Wallace Shuyinka was born in Nigeria in 1934. Uh, this son of an Anglican minister was quite a precocious and inquisitive child uh, who's, who was said to prompt adults to say he will kill you with his questions. Now that inquiring mind led uh, him to study uh, at university in Ibadan, and then he went on to the UK where he studied at the University of Leeds. He graduated from there with a degree in English literature in 1958. Professor Shoyinka went on to a prolific career, that's putting it mildly, that saw him pen some of Africa's greatest works in drama, novels, autobiographies, essays, and poetry. In 1986, Professor Wale Shoyinka was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature, the first African to receive the honor, although he himself may argue that Albert Camus should claim that right. Professor Shoyinka is known also for his staunch political activism and his courage in speaking truth to power. As we say in Nigeria, if he see am, he go talk am. Now, in 1967, he was held as a political prisoner for almost two years for appealing for a ceasefire in the civil war that raged at that time. Before we sit down with the good professor, and I do hope he's reconnected, they'll tell us shortly, uh, I'd like to now hand over to the person responsible for creating the Hakima series, the chair of this event, uh, the director of UNDP's Regional Bureau for Africa, Ahuna Eziakonwa. Ahuna. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, can we just um, see if the prof is, is, is back? Indeed. Oh, sorry, I'm starting my video. Virtual circulation, yes. Yes, okay. Wonderful. A uh, warm welcome to you, prof. Uh, Mark just uh, 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 gave you an introduction. Um, but I want to say what a great pleasure it is to have you on this platform today. It's not every day that uh, we have this honor and privilege of having uh, someone of your stature grace our occasion and have this conversation with our audience. This time we hope will be an enjoyable time also for you. We want you to have fun as much as we're going to have fun. Uh, been uh, with you. And I start with a little personal anecdote, if you allow me. In, it was 34 years ago, I believe, in 1986, that you stood on that global platform and accepted a prestigious award. And I am grateful that I was old enough, although a young uh, uh, African girl at the time, but old enough 
to observe that moment, to embrace it, to take it in, to be influenced by it and to feel a deep sense of pride. Um, and, but it was much later that I, it began to dawn on me why I was so proud of that moment because my generation, post-colonial generation, inherited an Africa, a Nigeria, I come from Nigeria myself, that was still very much, I mean, Nigeria was only 22 years old, still very much in that cloud of colonial domination, um, where you, you were more seen as a subject than the one that was making changes. And the focus was more on ourselves. And to see one of ours on a global stage um, exporting wisdom and talent and influencing the world gave me such inner confidence that it was okay. Not only okay to be African, but that as an African, I was a global citizen. And one day I too could be influencing the world. And I tell you, um, that moment was translated into many things for my generation. And I know there are many who had this influence, but one of the uh, many things that I've wished for an opportunity to be able to tell you directly from is the fact that I'm one of the beneficiaries of a fight that you fought so hard uh, in the literary world and in education. I was a student of literature and you fought for us to move from English literature to literature in English. Very fundamental difference. You gave us African children the opportunity not only to be exposed to the Chaucer's and Shakespeare's, great as their works were, but that our education would also come to include the fine works of our own people, of Africans, of the Ngugi Watiungus, the Wale Shoinkas, the Chino Achebes, the Emechetas. And studying African literature, I can tell you, is partly responsible for where I sit today in my position as director of the Regional Bureau for Africa, because it cultivated in me a deep love for the continent, a continent that had been literally condemned by the world as the dark continent, a place of hopelessness, a place of charity. But my contact with the literary work of Africans led to my basically define that characterization and understanding that I am part of a world, of a continent that had value and that it was worth fighting for. And for all of my life, that's been a mission and a preoccupation. And I thank you for that because what you represent led to that journey in my own life and I know in the lives of many of our generation. And I, want to, I wanted to start with that, Prof, uh, because what we're about to talk to talk about today. It's about wisdom. And this we've chosen very carefully this word, hekima, uh, which is a Swahili word. Uh, wisdom, because the world is on its knees. Coronavirus has created an unprecedented situation. Uh, and yet it's a world that's been through, uh, been to hell and back. We've had the Great Depression in this part of the world. We've had two world wars. We've had devastation um, uh, at the continent, uh, on the continent of Africa as well. But everyone, almost without exception, admits that the world has never experienced a crisis such as this that flattens every curve that we've ever known. And yet, it hit at a time when the world was much advanced in technology and well. And yet everyone realizes that there is a missing 
factor that wisdom is required. Where will that wisdom come from? And I want to um, quote a verse in the letter that you co-signed with several African intellectuals to African leaders, which says, and I quote, the global order is disintegrated before our eyes, giving way to a vicious geopolitical tussle. The new context of economic war of all against all leaves out countries of the global south, so to speak, stranded. Once again, we are reminded of their perennial status in the world order in the making, that of docile spectators. It goes on to say, rather than sit idle and wait for better fortune, we must endeavor to rethink the basis of our common destiny from our own specific historical and social context and the resources we have, end of quote. These are African intellectuals yourself included writing to African leaders. Are Africans today bystanders as the world tries to reset itself? Because coronavirus obviously has shocked the world into understanding that something needs to be different. But what is the role that Africa plays in that? As you stood on that world stage in 1986, representing a new wisdom, do you find that another moment is created for Africa to weigh in rather than be that docile uh, partner that this letter describes. At UNDP, we have a conviction, which is that coronavirus has been so far devastating its in its impact, but that we have a way to cheat it. And that way is to create a new normal that, that means we're bouncing back stronger, better in our humanity, because what was normal was the problem. That normal was an unequal world where 1% of us controlled 90% of the world resources. That normal was a world where there was little resilience to the shocks that we faced every day. Normal was unsustainable, where our consumption and production patterns left us robbing the next generation of clean breath, clean air. So the new normal has to produce new versions of us. And where is this wisdom going to come from? Development 2.0 is what we call it. And so when the Secretary General of the United Nations last month launched uh, his socioeconomic impact recovery response plan, he gave UNDP the lead role to deploy it uh, on the ground. And we are doing this series to mine the wisdom we know exists within the African um, ecosystem to be able to influence this agenda so that we're talking about a world that is more equal, a world where we have shared prosperity, a world that is sustainable. And it comes with this enduring love for our humanity. And before I give you the floor, Prof, I want to cite one of my most, one of my favorite quotes of yours that, uh, that is out there. It says that na nations should die so that humanity can survive. It's very profound. And as you speak today, I want you to reflect a little bit for us on that. Another quote says that human life has meaning only to that degree and as long as it is lived in the service of humanity. And then the third and last one 
that um, it will be really useful to get you to unpack. The hand that dips into the bottom of the pot eats the biggest snail. What does that mean? Over to you, Prof. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, let me congratulate uh, this initiative, <clears throat> those behind it, um, for creating a platform for reflection in these dire times, but at any time. Now, that last quote is not original to me. It's a traditional, it's one of my favorites also, but it's a traditional um, uh, uh, quotation. And it simply says that we don't have to skim on the surface to feel satisfied with what we dredge from the pot, that we should not be afraid to dig right deep down in the pot because there may lie the richest part of that particular presentation, whatever, in any field. It's not just, it doesn't talk just about food. It talks about creativity. It talks about technology. It just says, dig deep if you really want to mine the riches of existence. So that's how I've always understood it. And that's why it's one of my favorite expressions. <laughs> now, the others, yes, I plead guilty to, um, to, uh, to uh, some of them. <clears throat> but again, once again, I always insist that this is not, there's very little originality in, in the world we live in. We exchange ideas, we pick up, and then build on little bits and pieces that we encounter. My attachment to humanity as a center of existence is the result, not only of meeting other human beings, but of what I've also read. I am entirely a product of my experiences, my encounters, and as I said, of my reading. One immediate example uh, to emphasize this, uh, the late, co um, the late, um, sorry, the late, um, General Secretary of, uh, what's wrong? I suddenly got a, of uh, the United Nations. His name will come back in a moment. Ghanaian, I don't know why. Kofi Annan. Thank Ophiana. you. That's it, he suddenly slipped. And um, the, the, uh, at the end of the century, he had this vision of Africa resurgent. And he set up what he called the Millennium uh, Council or whatever. And we had together, uh, and the center of his message was this, his um, sort of propulsive um, uh, directive for us was to see, to try and make humanity understand that humanity is the center of existence and that all planning must be directed towards the enhancement of the human entity, whether as a collective or as an individual. And this was a kind of caravan. I mentioned it in my book, um, 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 uh, Hamatan, the African edition is uh, Hamatan Spring, African Spring in Hamatan condition, something like that. Uh, the foreign edition is of Africa. And I emphasized this uh, particular conference, which was like a caravan of ideas. Moved from Dakar to Mozambique, the Republic of Benin to Côte d'Ivoire. And this sort of bazaar of ideas concentrated on what the African governments, you know, intellectuals, humanists can do to enhance that entity, which we call the African individual. It was a rich one, uh, a rich exercise for me. And it built, again, we emphasize this, it built on similar conferences in the past. NEPAD, Audience Africa, uh, and I remember one particular one which took place in, um, in uh, Dakar. Uh, I remember distinctly because it was a meeting of technocrats, intellectuals, scientists, and governments, heads of government. Our own General Obasanjo, I remember, attended this as well. I recall it because he offered me a ride in his plane. But the idea, yeah, and this for me was sort of like the summation 
of all things that had gone ahead. Because we were meeting those who direct policies, who execute those policies, who formulate policies, I beg your pardon, who execute them, and those who are committed, whose entire existence is bound up on ideas, formulating ideas. And so there's been no shortage of the recognition of the human entity. It's just been a lack of will and uh, to formulate and execute policies which actually, for instance, throw, throw up African as an individual to be reckoned with anywhere in the world. That has been the center of the problem. Mm. Thank, you very, thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's fascinating. And thank you very much, Ahuna. Now, uh, in the interest of time, we're going to move on uh, to the, the next segment. We need to move on to the question and answer segment. This is the call and response uh, segment. And we've asked uh, f our 46 country offices to harvest questions from our, all around the continent, some fascinating questions. And we'll also have questions from three interveners. And I'll be keeping an eye on the chat box to the right, which I can see some questions already coming in for you, Professor. So um, are you ready, Professor, uh, with the first question? Uh, the first question is from Malawi. Uh, and it's this, it says, every crisis highlights the best and the worst of human beings and societies. What are the assets Africa can build on and what challenges do you uh, feel that Africa needs to overcome? What are the assets that Africa can build on and what are the challenges Africa needs to overcome, particularly in the context of what we've been discussing COVID-19? Over to you, Professor. Uh, the first recognition <clears throat> is that, at least in my view, that COVID-19 was inevitable. Why do I say that? We've had a series of epidemics, pandemics. We had uh, SARS, we had Ebola, we had HIV, and of course the world itself has had a long history, the bubonic plague, the black plague, etc., etc., and to me, human society should always be prepared. And each society has its own very peculiar problems, conditions, histories, economic patterns, productivity patterns. The mistake I believe that we make on the African continent is to believe that our own methodology of coping with these has to be exactly along the same lines as other societies. And so when, we, when something hits, other society and gets to us, we tend to respond in exactly the same way as other assailed societies. Whereas we have the possibility of recognizing differences, of har harvesting, really harnessing what other people have discovered, what they've applied, but also adjusting these to our own potential. I think that has been the mistake which was made, this is not a recrimination. This COVID was very special. And let me tell you, I am not astonished. I don't blame too many countries for not responding as they, I think they should know. This really was sudden and it was phenomenal. However, on this continent, I think we made a mistake of trying to pursue the same lines of response as others and look at what happened in the United States, look at what has happened in Italy, in the United Kingdom, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Up till today, for instance, I haven't seen an updated version of, of those uh, claimed cures by Madagascar, in Nigeria, over here. I haven't seen anything pursued. Flash in the pan, and then suddenly we don't hear anything more about it. At least let us know if, if this works. Let us know if these were charlatans talking or whether there were potentials. So th this is this aspect which bothers me, quite frankly. Not the failures as such in general, not the escalation, but simply the fact that I don't get the feeling that leadership really responds to even the potential of contest against this pandemic. Professor, um, the next question is from Senegal, and in particular, it's from one of Ahuna's predecessors. He's a former RBA director, Abdoulaye Mar Dieh. Uh, and this, I guess, question is asking how we can uh, go into the future by looking at the past. It says, 
beyond finding solutions for a new Africa, Africa, the cradle of humanity, has solutions for this new world, global solutions. It, uh, it's here the first very, hu very first human rights framework was written, the Mande Charter. It e existed even before the Magna Carta. It promoted human rights, especially the rights of women. It promoted human dignity, respect for nature and truth, the importance of sharing and caring for all, and the promotion of prosperity and education. Professor, how can we draw on African history and culture like this to find a new social contract for this new reality? Professor. Well, <clears throat> let's begin by once again, I, 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 I don't mean to sound pessimistic or anything of the sort. I'm just saying that actually we have been through these questions again and again and again. If you look at the uh, product of some of those conferences, those gatherings, which I mentioned earlier, you'll find that within them, whether we're talking about conferences around the concept of Ubuntu, whether we're talking about conferences around the theme of African personality, Pan-Africanism or whatever, there has been no shortage of solutions being proposed. There's a disjunct, however, between leadership and thinkers. I think that is our main, that is our, our main problem. Mm -hmm. There are times when I think that maybe we should move to drastic solutions. Maybe we, do, we could even move away from the beaten path and say, why don't we create a model nation? Why don't the various African countries say, look, we want to adopt this manageable sized country, a small one, not too complicated, and so that all the African continents adopt this and we want to produce in that, within those geographical borders, the ideal model African state. I'm sorry, it sounds um, impossible, it sounds extreme, but what else am I supposed to offer after having attended so many serious-minded conferences, come out with ringing resolutions, practical, I'm talking about practical solutions, I'm talking about conferences which are broken up into working units, conferences which have lasted not just three days, one week, like the, um, the Millennium uh, uh, conference, which lasted nearly a whole year, what, are, what other prospects are available to us, but something totally out of the ordinary? So my answer to you, I'm sorry, is to say, I don't care whether it's Gambia or um, which, is, which are the other sort of pocket-sized nations, for the, all the African countries to descend on it and say, listen, we're adopting you for two, three years. And we're going to produce a model African nation. Beyond that, I'm sorry, I have no new ideas. <laughs> it's a wonderful idea nonetheless. And I'm from your mouth to God's ears. I'm, I'm looking at the chat room and I can see already uh, some very positive uh, results. People are enjoying this. Uh, a quasi Sapong in, in Ghana says that uh, as a young person, I find Professor Wale Shoyinka's dialogue today an excellent example of intergenerational chat with me and other young people participating in his uh, wisdom in this conversation. Thank you uh, from Ghana. Now, staying on that theme of young people, I would like to bring in uh, the first intervener, uh, if they're ready and standing by. Um, this is a, a, a lady, a young lady called Matabo Mohwaduba. She's South African, and she's also a fellow of the African Young Women Leaders Fellowship Program, which is a UNDP-led uh, program, which also includes um, the African Union. So, Matabo, are you there? Yes, I'm here, Mark. Okay, please go ahead and ask your question to the professor. Uh, thank you, Mark, and thank you, Ahuna. Good day, Professor Shoyinka. I'm very humbled to be engaging and drawing some wisdom from you. My question is as follows. I believe that no solutions derived from these very important conversations are going to catalyze Africa into the new era unless African youth is meaningfully engaged, especially women. Thus, what is your advice to young, energetic, radical, capable, and um, 
educated African youth that are ready to take their seats at the table, but often feel that they are denied the opportunity to do so. And those that are granted opportunities feel as though their roles are more tokenistic as opposed to substantive. Thank you. Good, I'm very glad you asked the uh, generational question. It gives me an opportunity to emphasize uh, this initiative, this letter which we all signed, was actually an initiative of the younger generation. And uh, one of my first uh, responses to them is, listen, you are going to do all the work. It's about time we left the stage to you. Now, there are many answers to uh, that proposition, many approaches. One is for the young generation to mobilize themselves and take power. Take Nigeria as an example. That's a very large young voting population. And during the last election, we interacted with a number of them who said, listen, why don't you come together? Those of you who have ambitions or the impulse towards leadership, reconstruction, creative transformation of society, how do we get together? And let us have a candidate and we will campaign for you. If it's a consensus candidate and it's somebody in whom we can believe, who's come from out of that generation. Mind you, in fairness, they started late. They started coming out very late. By this time, the troglodytes, the old Neanderthals, they, they'd already made their moves. And of course, they were already solidly entrenched. But at least they came out, they made a move. It didn't work out, there was dissension, but what do you expect? With the first try. And so, let us see what happens the next time. Let us see whether this generation has learned from the mistakes of, of the unpreparedness of the last exercise. And let's see what happens during the next election. So that's one way. The other way, of course, is to select a political party, which you believe is genuinely new thinking oriented and see whether from the inside you can make a difference. That's another one, of course, but it might get you into trouble. Like my young uh, friend, uh, Shawari, for instance, you can come out and say revolution now, but don't look at me to come and bail you out because I don't know what will happen to you. <laughs> so try and pick some of the more uh, energetic, more constructive, the, the greater possibilities, and also create movements, even if you cannot immediately provide, uh, uh, mount a political platform. We talk about women, for instance. There was a very capable woman in the election before the last who formed the COA party, and I looked forward to her coming out again during the last election. However, her party didn't feel that. I think it's, it's, it's a great, you know, lack. And, um, it's, it's cutting off the potential of humanity when you push the one gender aside. You're already undermining your creative workforce. I mean, you're cutting yourself down. And so I have no patience whatsoever for societies, whether they're based on religion or any ideology, which reduces the potential and the, uh, the uh, accessibility of opportunity to any gender. I cannot, I am totally impatient with gender discrimination. Gender discrimination leads eventually to reducing the woman as a human being and leads to the kind of epidemic which we're having in Nigeria today, a rape epidemic. It is so disgusting. I mean, once it was South Africa, which was the rape capital of the world. Today it is Nigeria, every day, under age whether the rape to dominate, to prove they are macho, or the rape because some stupid uh, mercenary uh, medicine man has told them that if they rape a child, they'll become millionaires. Whatever it is, we're losing our humanity. And that loss has been expressed mostly by our oppression of the vulnerable in society. So many, many opportunities, many platforms for the young generation to express themselves, not just rhetorically, but real platforms in need of being mounted for the dissemination of these critical issues of society. 
Thank you, Professor. And I, and I should mention that a Nobel, another Nobel laureate will be joining us in the next edition of the Akima series, probably in a couple of weeks, Dr. Dennis Mukwege, who, of course, won the Nobel Prize for Peace uh, in 2018 for um, his work around uh, sexual and gender-based violence in conflict situations. So that subject that you brought up, Professor, will be uh, at a hot topic uh, in the next Hakima conversation. Now, as I look at the chat, uh, there's some very topical and timely questions here. Uh, and one of those questions relates to uh, a global phenomenon that we've seen in, in the last couple of weeks. It says, it's a great, and it's from um, Brigadier General S.K. Usman. He says, it's a, it's a real great a pleasure to have Professor Shoyinka on the panel. Professor, please, what do you make of the I can't breathe movement? Uh, Professor, are you still there? I think I've lost your uh, camera. Yes, there you are. It's not. Yeah. It's a, uh, what do you make of the I can't breathe movement in the United States of America and the eradication of racism in that country. Now this uh, movement, the uh, uh, Black Lives Matter movement, ha has already made waves in America. Um, uh, the Minneapolis, Minneapolis police force may be disbanded and replaced with another entity. Uh, just recently, a few days ago, a hundred uh, death row inmates uh, are going to have their cases reviewed to see whether racism played a part uh, in their uh, convictions, uh, and it's sending tremors uh, through the system. He is asking, what can we learn from this, uh, other African countries, and is there something that we can take away from the I can't breathe uh, movement and the movement happening in America at the moment? Professor. Yes. Um, it's a very pertinent question, and what is happening in the United States is of enormous importance to us on the continent. Uh, we'll be very foolish if we failed to recognize within our own society the kind of dehumanization of black peoples going on in the United States, and of course, which has been, which has been there all the time, if we fail to make any correlation between that and the dehumanization on our own soil by our own people, whether it's by leadership, whether it's by the military, whether it's by the police, whether it's by any kind of institution of state or uh, private uh, enterprise, which dehumanizes, even if it's their own employees. The state, nothing surprises me there. Uh, the I Can't Breathe movement started during the campaign of Donald uh, Trump. Um, as I mentioned at the time, the rise of black killings, you know, moved astronomically during the campaign of Donald Trump to power. And it was evident. Yes, well, you know, we're here, you know where we are, so, yes, and this, this is something which we have not confronted brutally, to say to the past, the government here, that part of the problem of this dehumanization of us is by these people is because they see themselves reflected by power, by the incumbent of power at the very top. This is why. All the way from the north to the south, by Elsa, uh, Auguste, uh, Oyo, even sometimes incursions in Lagos, you have these steady, steady sequences of atrocities. So what is happening in the United States by racists, by the racist police, by the rednecks and so on, is because they see at the, at the head of government a reflection of themselves and therefore they act with impunity. All the inner urgence, which have been suppressed by the hedges, the balances, the laws of the United States, because the United States is basically a very civilized society, unfortunately plagued by the worst of all human propensities, which is xenophobia, a group of people, a certain section of society, a society which has not lived beyond its slave history, for which it should be apologizing to the rest of the world for the rest of its existence. That's, by the way, that's Wally Shinka talking. Basically, the important thing is for us to understand the fact that power, even surrogate power, 
when his self-identification with power tends to seize any opportunity to dominate the rest of society. Just a uh, last word on that. I saw a film recently, one of the most depressing films I've seen in a long while. It's a video. It was on Mobutu. Any herdsman thinks he's God. And until we manage to destroy that mentality, especially when there is leadership which can identify the heart of the problem and say to his own people, listen, enough is enough. Uh, Professor, if I could now uh, give the floor back to our uh, director, um, I think that, you know, many of the things that you say resonate like a clarion call to the uh, UNDP. RBA is the largest, uh, um, uh, it's the largest agency in, in, the, uh, in the UNDP family. And UNDP has an extended role with COVID-19 uh, in the response and recovery as the technical lead. Um, I'd like to just ask Ahuna what she thinks and, and touch on some of the things that you've said, Ahuna. Yes, I think one of the compelling things that I, I'm picking up, um, Prof, is, is this, you know, I really heard you when you say we've been there, done that. We've been through so many forums, so many conferences, so many retreats where we're constantly putting solutions on the table. And I believe you because we have seen every time we raise an issue uh, that needs a solution, somebody makes reference to something that exists either at the African Union or elsewhere that's been there on the table, but not really taken uh, to the next level. And, and this, I was saying uh, while you, you, you were trying to reconnect, is a challenge that we see for ourselves as, as a UN development program. Because there are solutions on the ground and we're starting to pick up on how we actually translate those solutions into, uh, um, into practical uh, realization. Uh, the UNDP has, the of UNDP launched last year what we call the accelerator labs. Uh, there are now 34 of them on the continent of Africa, and they are basically our listening posts for uh, new uh, imagined solutions, newly imagined solutions for innovations, uh, mostly I must say coming from young people, where we listen to these solutions and we help create platforms, first of all, to connect them uh, and the whole value chain, but also to promote uh, and amplify and, and, and bring them to scale. And, and so that orientation that we have now, knowing that solutions that come from within, uh, you can also get solutions from outside and adapt them. But we have been really missing out on tapping into harnessing so those homegrown solutions that could uh, lead to the model African country that you're talking about. I mean, we're starting to see signs that this is actually possible where you do the whole value chain of development in one country uh, using the wisdom and the, and the talent of, of the people, not just one group of people. The diversity becomes very important. The intergenerational nature becomes very important. The gender that you spoke about, where we bring the assets of women, men from North, from South uh, to enrich the menu. Uh, of solutions that we have. So that I think is, is, is one uh, item, hot item that you put on the table that warrants uh, further investigation, this disconnect between the thinkers and the solutions and the execution at the leadership level. Back to you, uh, Mark. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor, uh, two doors down from you over there in Nigeria sits Bright Simons. He's in Ghana. Bright, are you there? Yes, I am, Mark. Now, you're a social innovator. You're a writer. I read a lot of your stuff. You're a thinker yourself, and you're the founder of a, a technology firm called M Pedigree. Uh, and I believe Fast Company magazine named it as one of the most innovative companies in Africa in 2020. Thanks for joining us, Bright. You have a question for the good professor, do you not? I do, Mark. Thank you for having me. Prof, it's an amazing experience. It's a great delight to be connecting to you by this medium. As a young teenage boy in Ghana, I used to trek to the library where I believe I've read every single one of your books. 
Um, some of your plays have stayed with me for a very long time and have completely impacted the course of my activism. But the ones that have stayed with me the most in those ones, you seem to paint these domains, whether it's in the scourge of higher sense with the prison scene or madmen and specialists with your famous Dr. Barrow. There's always these domains where power, raw power, always seem to be able to invert the norm. And then you ask in the preface to A Play of Giants, one of the most haunting books I've ever read, where you ask, why is it that some people will rather preside over a cemetery than not preside at all, or worse to that effect? And I wonder whether in the many decades of activism, you finally come close to discerning this psychology of power that makes some so completely impervious, absolutely impervious to humanity. Thank you. Um, you know, don't you sometimes feel that you are being eaten piecemeal? I do sometimes, or at least that an attempt is being made to eat me piecemeal. When I see someone exercising brutal power on another, I, I see a cannibal. That's, that's where I, I, I actually see one human being feeding on another. Uh, you think that a play of dance was a bit on the, um, on the uh, <laughs> uh, cannibalistic side. You wait and see something I've been working on, which will be coming out very soon. It's uh, literally people eat one another there. I hardly ever talk about anything <laughs> which is improved, but this time I will use it as an illustration. I just get that um, it's more than a metaphor for me. Power reduces the other humanity constantly. And therefore, for me, that aspect of cannibalism is more than just a metaphor. One person is feeding on another. Is feeding on that person's humanity, his identity, his dignity, reducing another individual to a cipher. Again, it's like the, the video on Mobutu I watched earlier. You can look at all the dictators who have been plagued this continent. Whether you're talking about one of the most recent, this Jame character who finally was thrown out of Gambia, whether you're talking about Idi Amin, we're talking about Improbo Kasa, we're talking about Makais and Guema, you'll find, and this is when I first told a colleague, a very, very respected, lovable colleague, that Idi Amin was actually feeding on other human beings. He didn't believe me, physically, that he had a head in the fridge. He said, oh, come on, come on, you're a victim of, uh, yeah, Western propaganda. I said, no, no, no. My source is very reliable. There are dictators who drink human blood. And in this film of uh, Mobutu, of Mobutu, one of his closest aides, his former minister of information, confirmed that Mobutu used to drink human blood in order to be able to exercise, to obtain and maximize power of other human beings. So it's not a wild metaphor, you know. And until we get humanity, our humanity, to understand that the other person is a person, is a human being. It's a process of education. It's a process of campaigning, propaganda, demonstration, illustration in many ways, catching them young, because actually it's the young people also who grow up to be monsters, and also demonstrating the creative capacity of the humanity of our society. So I understand, I sympathize with your, uh, with your discomfort with my uh, use of that metaphor, but believe you me, it's a very realistic one to me. Mark, you're muted. Mark, I'm mute. Sorry about that. Mark, yes, okay. 
Yes, I've got yeah. it. So, yeah. um, thank you, Bright. That's an excellent question. Um, we're going to stay on that sort of theme because there are a lot of questions about leadership, both that have been sent in from around mm -hmm. the country and are coming in right now uh, from the chat room. People want to understand how they can galvanize better leadership. David Omozwafo um, asks uh, a question related to one of your books as well, The Man Died, perhaps your most famous book. Uh, he said in your book, The Man Died, you made this statement. Soon it is the hour when all dead awaken. As the key turns in my lock, I ask the warder, what became of the suffering man? The man died, he said. Now, his question is, are Africans really demanding services from the leaders to the degree that they could, could be, or is the man in us dead, as in your book? Um, the, there was, that question kept breaking, so if I didn't answer it um, succinctly, please, it's because I maybe missed part of it. Um, it it's all has to do with life valuation. Look at what COVID is teaching all of us. I would like, I haven't seen any figures uh, uh, published, but I would like to compare the recent figures of migrants or would be migrants with pre COVID statistics. If our leadership really cares, collectively, individually, I believe that the shame of migration that we're witnessing over the past few years, across the Sahara, across the Mediterranean, I think that shame should have gone to, got to them, in which they sat down together, analyzed the situation, the causes, and come up with some solution, some practical, workable, and sustainable solution. For any leader, I mean, I have seen Nigerians washed up on the shores of Estonia, Lampedusa, etc., given burials there. And of course, you, read, you see all the videos, you see the pursuit uh, by patrol boats, as well as the very humane rescues of hundreds, children, women, and our leaders on this continent are satisfied to say they are ruling over a people, African people, who have been subjects of disdain for centuries at the hands of others, the slave trade, the colonialism, brutal settler colonialism, and they don't feel a sense of remedial urgency. They say, we must terminate this, this, uh, this history of the decimation, the degradation of our own people. It's something which puzzles me. And I think this is one of the tasks for, especially for the younger generation, because it's your generation that has been wasted in the Mediterranean, wasted across the Sahara Desert. It is your generation. And you must take your leadership to task. Why do you have to live under such conditions, undergo such brutal? brutal conditions just to go and be servants and slaves in other areas. So any leader who does not make this one of his or her cardinal, cardinal commitments is for me uh, indifferent to the fate of Africans. Now, Professor, uh, you mentioned uh, the young people. And we'll hear from our third uh, and final intervener who's a young uh, lady uh, um, from Rwanda, who's in, in uh, uh, standing by at the moment. But before I go to her, I want to ask a specific question. And this comes from our uh, home country of Nigeria uh, about young people and in particular about education. Now, this is something you've spoken widely on. Uh, everyone will agree that the level of education in Africa is not where we'd like it to be. Um, you, in Africa, you've gone as saying that the youth of today deserve an apology from your generations and generations before for the erosion in educational standards. How, how did we get here? And how can we maybe use COVID-19 to create a revolution in learning? I know you've said that today's graduates are at the level of your generation were when you were about to leave school. Professor. 
Yes, this is one of the extracts, positive uh, extracts we might be able to make from COVID. Now, I, I've been to a number of educational institutions, as you know, some years ago, I was uh, in uh, one of the Southern states where I saw what was, you know, uh, gearing up to be a kind of modern teaching, electronic teaching classrooms, uh, very well equipped, you know, trained teachers. And I said to myself, hmm, this is uh, one way uh, of uh, remedial action uh, for this absolutely intolerable condition is the answer. Or what is the possibility of remedial action? A lot more emphasis, I believe, should now be placed on, sorry, virtual teaching. I'm not very fond of these gadgets. They keep going off, as you see here all the time. But at least it is one way, not merely of making education more accessible, but also even making it very interesting. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm not a technocrat, I'm not a technologist, but I appreciate the value and the potential of teaching virtually. Uh, and it shouldn't be underestimated. And the so-called University of the Air, the former University of the Air, is for me just an evolution. I mean, it has evolved, evolved into what you might call virtual teaching. That is the correspondence school. I've written a number of articles about it, but it's just a progression from the old, old correspondence schools to the so-called University of the Air. And now we have virtual teaching. However, it should not be a substitute. I would, I still believe that it is necessary, for instance, it is necessary to shut down universities for a while, revamp it completely. Look at the, I'm talking about Nigeria, with, with, with which I'm most familiar, right. Revamp it completely, make certain rules, restore a collegial sensibility, which is very much missing. Uh, universities here close down sometimes for months. Sometimes it takes six years for a student to graduate a course, which normally should take three years. So something is fundamentally broken. It's not something that can be glued together. It has to be a revolutionary approach to education. And one of the ways, simultaneously, if you like, is virtual teaching while universities reassess their curricula, re-examine the qualifications of their teachers, because many of these teachers should not be standing there trying to instruct anybody. Universities discover them all the time, all the time. It's horrendous to encounter some people who say they have been through the university process. It's embarrassing. And for me, it's degrading for the future of any universe, of any nation, any serious. Over to the floor, because of course, education skills capacity building is instrumental in the response that UNDP uh, has for Africa in its uh, uh, strategic uh, approach. It's called the Af Africa Promise. Please, Ahuna. Well, education is clearly an instrument for development, and uh, there is no escape in it. And I was just saying, Prof, it's very interesting, the solutions that you are alluding to are contained in the, the global goals, the, the sustainable development goals that you know, countries signed up to in 2015. Uh, you know, if you remember the Millennium Development Goals, we uh, focused on getting access to education for, uh, for as many people yeah. as we So the universal primary education and all of that happened. And we did succeed in uh, broadening access. However, we uh, go beyond our access, is beyond uh, butts on, on, on desks to quality. Uh, but of course, something that we have not yet achieved, even with those goals set, and how COVID-19 has indeed provided some insights as to how we could utilize virtual learning, uh, e-learning as we call it. And it is, uh, it is an imperative for development actors that we actually use this crisis to figure out how to uh, get quality education to all. Uh, because obviously there are some sections of society that get this quality education because they can afford it. And the danger there is that we're widening inequality. 
um, in the process because those who have better education will go on to hold better jobs. And those who have less education will go stay at the bottom. So if we're going to conquer inequality, we have to look seriously at the education sector and how we equalize in mm -hmm. education. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and Professor, yes. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. looking at the... Uh, I'm looking over at the chat, and uh, that's really a hot topic. Uh, uh, Benedict Toi from uh, Burkina Faso uh, believes it's, he, he, he agrees with you. He says uh, it's totally true about university. Something is really broken, and we need to build this thing now. Uh, Simon Akinades uh, says the question of standards, a tricky one. It's impossible to move hundreds of millions to the level of elitist schools we inherited from colonization. Uh, I agree with Professor Shoyinka that what matters is revamping educational systems across the continent. And then Claire van der Varenen says that uh, the job of preserving humanity is never done. It must be repeated generation after generation, adapting to technology and the shape of society. The perennity of institutions can be a bulwark but it's not foolproof. What are the esteemed professor's views on what the key elements of this preservation are? She's asking, is the UN Charter, for example, still the key? Professor. Well, um, education is a tricky uh, subject. I agree with you 100%. What are we being educated in? Let, let, me, let me give an example of Yoruba language. Somebody wants to become proficient in my language. I expect that person to receive a teaching on the history, on the philosophy, <clears throat> on the productivity, and the language itself of the Yoruba people. It's literature, it's art. This is a rounded, this is what I understand by rounded education. If I want to be uh, a mechanical engineer, the same rules apply. And of course, you can just um, train people to use their mind through any route. In other words, <clears throat> even whether you're studying a language or you're studying a history, if your mind is not being trained to deal with the material of that particular discipline, in other words, to question it, to, wear, to worry the material like a dog, a bone, to propose alternatives to what you have received as instruction from schools, to do comparative studies. This is the training of the mind. And when I speak of education, I'm talking about that, that kind of training. So that if I'm coming into a subject for the very first time, ground level, never knew anything about it, I can apply my mind to the nitty gritty, the nuances and the concrete issues within that particular subject, admitting, being intelligent enough to say, I don't understand this. I don't know this. How does this relate to that? It is that kind of education I'm talking about. The people, the kind of product we're having right now, that kind of product, individuals who don't even understand the nature of their discipline, how much more be able to relate that discipline to other disciplines, to understand that there's a basic, there's a basic level of application which relates to all disciplines, no matter which one. That is what is missing in our system of education. It's not even so much painful idea to understand the subject itself. The mind is not trained. And to use a Nigerian expression, we are breeding mumus who go on the internet and think that they're thinkers. So um, let's go now to South Africa. Uh, if she's standing by, she's actually uh, in Johannesburg. We're going to go to Johannesburg uh, to a Rwandese entrepreneur, a young Rwandese entrepreneur. Uh, she's the CEO of non-zero Africa, which is a consultancy focused on socio-economic impact in Africa. Her name is Tanya Habimana. Tanya, are you there? Can we hear you? I'm here, Mark. Thank you. Go ahead and ask your question to the professor. Thanks. Professor, it's such an honor and privilege to be engaging with you today. And you mentioned quite a few times humanity. So 
You know, when we're looking at your life, your success, your triumph, we're pretty much looking at it from the other side of trial. But we know that there's been tough, challenging, scary, rough times where your dreams and the things that you were so fervently fighting for seemed like they were collapsing and like there was no hope. So my question is, what did you do in those times and what advice do you have for young people like myself who are going through such times now? All right. You, at the beginning, you said I mentioned something several times. I lost that completely. Humanity. 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 Ah, yes. Okay. Well, for me, what else is there? Sometimes I envy religious people. Uh, sometimes. Because their reality is somewhere out there. I don't know where it is. But it seems to satisfy them. Similarly, on my side, what I see and what I count on and what I can relate to are beings myself around me, whether they're in need, whether they're productive, uh, whether they're, they're clowns, they're jesters, their needs, their anxieties. This is what I describe as humanity. This is what makes us what we are, thinking, feeling, relating beings. I like the expression, for instance, some, uh, of... Uh, uh, Desmond Tutu's Ubuntu, when he says, he translates Ubuntu as a bundle of humanity, the bundle of humanity. And that means that humanity is not just one human. Yes, the individual is important. You must not lose the individual within the collective. However, the, collect, the individual does not stand alone. Otherwise, he's not human. I can only recognize my own humanity in relation to other people. That does not mean I'm not an individualist. I am, okay? It's before you accuse me of contradicting <laughs> myself at other times. No, no, but basically, I can understand, I can relate, I can fulfill myself only in relation to other human beings. So humanity for me is not abstract. It is not abstract at all. And when I read about the rape of underage when I read about the, the brutality, the torture of other human beings, when I read about uh, quote unquote accidental discharge or roadblocks by some drunken policemen, when I read of George Floyd, yes, that is my humanity, which is being brutalized there. I feel it exactly as if it has been done to me. That's why I, relate, I mentioned the issue of uh, Desmond Tutu. And without that recognition, for me, I, I can walk into the bush and just live there and uh, relate to animals. Uh, but we're in society. Society is made of human beings. The totality is what I understand by humanity. Uh, Professor, staying with that idea of Ubuntu, this is something that has, in a way, has uh, re-emerged since COVID-19 uh, came about. The spirit, as you say, of Ubuntu dictates that our very existence is defined by our connection with each other, and I guess our contribution to each other's lives. Um, I guess the, uh, one of the terms is humanity is the quality we owe each other. Um, I am because we are. Now, across the world, not just in Africa, but across the world, we've seen COVID-19 galvanize us to help each other. There have been tremendous acts of kindness that we've seen. In a way, that people have woken up to each other to a great degree. Um, how do we capitalize on that for, for the change that we want to see? COVID-19 is a brute. You mentioned humanity just now, but I think you were also simultaneously talking about community. COVID-19 breaks up community. I was, I worked, I walked uh, from my um, isolation in Abuja not so long ago. Uh, I needed something at the pharmacist. And I said, okay, let me come out of here. I came out with my mask and everything. I entered the supermarket. It's in Abuja. Enter the supermarket. Around the cashier, I saw a humanity. They were not wearing masks. They were behaving just as normal human beings. I wanted to say to them, break it up. You know very well, distancing, you know, six feet apart or six feet under. 
humanity has no choice but to observe equivalent of that in various forms, is a slogan. And this breaks up community. That's why I say that this COVID-19 is a brute. It breaks up community. We're going to have a peak. We're already having a peak. We are already having peaks in India. And if you look at where we're having the peaks, it's where humanity gathers. It's where community is a way of life. And where we put community above even the risk to themselves. There's something very heroic about it. But at the same time, it's something depressing. That is why I say this is one of the most difficult times that the world has really confronted. How do you deal with a society in which you have about seven people living in a room, and on one floor you may have about 10 families using the same toilet? You don't break up that kind of community overnight because the humanity will still sustain it. So you have to devise other means which relate to the way we were existing before COVID-19, but which transcends it. This requires imagination. It requires a collective activity. It's one of the reasons I got angry when uh, the, there was an attempt to, at the beginning to treat this affliction here in a kind of dictatorial terms. So somebody comes from the center and says, I dictate. Uh, to, uh, I detect to you what you do in the community. Oh, by all means, keep the borders, that's your problem. That's your, I mean, that's your responsibility. Keep the airspace and so on and so forth. But leave people in communities to work out their own salvation, guiding them, offering what they need to preserve community and at the same time, look after their health. This is what has been missing in our society. So I'm glad you asked that question. The ability, the imaginative, approach, the creative approach, we preserves in one form or the other community, a humanity, and at the same time, caters for the health of every individual within the community. Now, I'm, I'm going to, to see. Learn to have, as a matter of course, we're wasting our time against COVID. Professor, I'm going to seize on that word, creativity. Um, regional integration, for example, is the watchword. It's the zeitgeist at the moment for the African Union and its member states, the idea that we can trade across borders. But some of the trade we've already seen that didn't wait for the policy makers, didn't wait for the politicians, are the creatives, uh, those Nollywood artists, those musicians, uh, where they've, they've transcended, they've truly become Pan-African. The power of creativity and the creative, especially with the young generation in, in Africa, is laudable. Now, we have this uh, uh, partnership initiative at UNDP called the African Influencers for Development, which we very much would like you to be a part of. And one of our, um, our influencers, one of our supergroup member, said something interesting which made me think of you. He said, we, for, we, we, we need to take what's good from our culture and combine it with some hand-picked, cherry-picked ideas from the West, be they technological and otherwise, combine the two and create something that's truly African, truly new. Now, that leads me to a question that comes from Uganda. And in terms of creativity, I want to talk about storytelling. What have you learned, this question says from Uganda, what have you learned about the power of storytelling and how can we create, control and build the African narrative to change the mindsets of Africans first about their power to succeed. What have you learned about the power of storytelling and how can we create, control, and build the African narrative to change the mindsets of Africans about the power to succeed, Professor? Before I answer that question, and don't let me forget it, I'll come back to it. That's my profession, so I don't want to neglect it. But when we're talking about community and the, if you like, the scientific approach to community, my mind went to my first visit to Cuba, where I went around at many, a couple of, quite a few decades ago, went around quite a bit, and I saw what you might call the modern community being created. It was created both physically, architecturally, and uh, the, um, in, in terms of service provision. For instance, I saw little communities, new modern communities, which actually were organized, heaven knows what's happening today, I don't know, but anyway then, which were organized in a way in which they made sure, the government made sure that you had at least one doctor within 
a certain circumference. You had one uh, nurse within a certain uh, environment, a certain sector. You had one uh, a school, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and these were models, and it worked, so that you didn't have, you didn't break up community, you know, simply by providing what you might call modern Western ways of organizing this. No, no, no. You can have literally, you can have your cake and eat it. It just requires planning, commitment, and a sense of ideology. And when I use the word ideology, I'm talking. I'm talking about textbook ideology. If you're a humanist, then you already have an ideology and you can program society along the requirements of that humanistic approach to things. So it is feasible, it is possible. Instead of these tenement places which breed diseases because of a communal, a communal way of sharing, which is not wrong, which is to be praised, which is to be preserved, you can modernize, you can organize, you can ensure accessibility to water. Look at COVID-19. They say, okay, you put your hand under the running water. The first time I saw that, I laughed. How much running water do you find? How many faucets, if they exist? So you can put soap on your hand if you like. There's black soap, traditional soap. You can use that. Where's the water? You have to look for a stream to go and wash that handy. And so it's a failure to provide these basic amenities, you know, which prevent us being able to tackle crisis of this kind. And we've got to go back to that sense of community for which we now say, this is what we know what a community needs. We know a community needs toilets. We know it needs running water. We know it needs health services. It must have shelter. And now we do it having learned from our failures and our punishment from COVID, we now go back to that sense of community and build on that community sense, but with modern, as you said, facilities. So much for that. Let's go to storytelling. No, I'm not very good at prescribing literature as solution. I just do things. I just do what I do and hope that my readers uh, can extract from such, uh, such works things which relate to the very problems which I'm dealing with, whether it's problems of human relationship, whether it's abuse of power, corruption in society, etc. I narrate, I have a short story through plays, articles, essays, polemics, etc., etc. I do what I can. The extraction is left to others. And so my advice to writers is just take whatever it is that inspires you, that agitates you, translate it into the literary form, put it out there, and where you can send it to, um, to anybody whom you know, who is in a position of influence. Beyond that, I'm sorry, I'm not a very good teacher of applied literature. I must confess that. Um, Professor, you're, you're talking about collaboration and coordination and you, this really resonates with us because this is what uh, we're all about at UNDP. And, and, and I think in a way we're sort of unique in the UN family in the lens we've gone uh, to broaden uh, that collaboration. In Nigeria, we have a saying in our country that a man cannot sit down alone and plan for prosperity. Uh, and so uh, partnership is really a, a, a key and important thing. So I hope that this conversation that we're having with you uh, is the beginning of a journey with you uh, towards uh, finding ways that we can uh, collaborate uh, towards uh, realizing the Africa that we want. We've been talking about a catalyzing change. Are you optimistic that we can take advantage of it? Uh, Mark, I've ceased using words like optimism or pessimism. I just say, let's work at it. Um, I, I, I don't like to think in terms of pessimistic or optimism, pragmatism and sense of commitment. That's all I can live by. If I look around me immediately, I will use one word I don't like to use. <laughs> <laughs>
it's been an, a tremendous pleasure speaking to you. It's always amazing. We've spent uh, many times on many stages uh, together. This is the first time we're doing anything virtual, and as I understand it, it's this the first is time. I, what a disappointment! This technology here, here. I hope you have better luck with your next uh, guest. That's all I can say. I think that since we this is the teething maiden voyage, we'll have to ask you to come back again. And by that time, we'll, we would have sorted out all the glitches. Uh, I'm now just going to hand over to round up. I'm going to hand back to the Regional Bureau for Africa's uh, uh, um, director just to, to sum up and crystallize some of the gems that you've given us uh, and then uh, take us to the close. Ahuna. Uh, impossible to summarize this rich conversation, uh, Prof, and your energy, enthusiasm, uh, and spirit is infectious. And I'm sure that all of our uh, members of the, of the audience have been infected by this uh, Shoyinka virus, which is really um, one of, of incredible humanity. Uh, and, and dip in that hand into the pot, the bottom of the pot. I think that's, that's, that's what I've felt throughout this conversation, that you left nothing on the surface and really drove us deep to that place where our core values and our core humanity resides. And I think, you know, it, it's, it, it would take a bit of time to unpack all of what, and I see lots of things flowing into the chat room. People have really been affected. I've, you know, I've, I've watched many of your conversations and deliveries. I, I think this is the most I've seen you. I, I started at the beginning saying that we want you to enjoy yourself. And at one point I saw you raise your glass of wine. It really came through that you were also enjoying this conversation and this connection. And I, I really thank you for just being you and, and giving it to us raw and real. And I thank our audience for their equally powerful presence because they contributed to the dynamic in asking the kind of questions that drew out uh, the richness that we know dwells in you. We are so grateful, our generation and the ones younger, to still have you around at 86, not only around, but present. It's, it's, it's an incredible gift to humanity. And I just want to register that because the, 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 the theme that ran through everything you said was this centrality of our shared humanity. And I must say, it, it does remind me of the reason why I work for the United Nations, because this is an organization that precisely tries to work at it, work at our shared humanity. The Secretary General has spent the last few years of his term fighting, fighting for multilateralism, fighting for the preservation of that which pulls all of us together. That thing you described as Ubuntu, the bundle of humanity that we are because the other person is. And it is, it, it, it does take personalities and the wisdom that you breathe into this kind of agenda to get all generations working at it. I agree with you, it's no longer a debate between optimism, optimism and, and pessimism, but that we have to, as a, as a journey, a humanity journey, keep working at this, whether you are two, uh, 20 years old or 86 years old, it's a collective mission. And one, the second thing that you really home did on was education. And Mark's, I think, brilliant opening on that, whether COVID-19 creates a revolution in learning. So education, I think you tore it apart. It's not just about educating or education, it's about learning. You called it training the mind. I take that away. When we unpack this idea of training the mind and training the mind doesn't mean that you just take it all as a perceived learner and internalize, but that you question, you interrogate that space. 
and you contribute something new, some, some different perspective. How are children's minds being trained? And if they are being trained in what? But there is a challenge, Prof, that I'd like to leave with you on this one. Uh, you made reference to the fact that we're churning out people who think that they're thinkers, but they know so little. But actually, in my journey with young people of Africa, I think the contrary is the case. We are putting a lot in them that is that is that holds little substance, but they're churning out quality. You know, it's it's very interesting because it, you know they are global citizens in spite of what we are investing in them. This is what I see from country to country, from community to community, even those with the least support have imaginations beyond expectation and have creativity that defies all reasoning in terms of their background. Uh, we work in the startup space with young people yesterday I, I had the privilege of meeting four young entrepreneurs from the continent who are changing the world. And I can tell you they're products of this crappy education system that you and I are talking about. But for some reason, they deliver. They are young African industrialists who on a daily basis are sorting out problems. They're finding problems and seeking solutions to to resolve that. They are not profit driven, but they're also not beggars. They're not NGOs with, 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 uh, with hats in hand. They are creating industry, creating jobs, and at the same time solving development challenges. They're in, it's where I find myself hope in this grim, and, 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 and very challenging world of vulnerability, uncertainty, complexity, and, and all of what we see that COVID has revealed. The hope lies with these young Africans who despite the, the, the high fences that we created for them to scale, are demonstrating the kind of resolve that you are talking about actually, that we need to end the, the brutality that is happening to our humanity. We must believe in these young people. And I'm so glad that many of them signed up to this call today to listen to you because they also need to be guided. They need the wisdom that comes from that generation that you represent, sorry. And, um, but, but, but they hold the key. And I'm so glad you challenged them today to say, even if you cannot have a political career now, start a movement. Start a movement of the heart of humanity and believe in your ability collectively to make change happen. And you say, you know, we, it's about time we, the older generation, left the stage to the young people. I'd like that message to go through because on the African continent, we always believe young people have little to offer. That's one of the fences that they have to scale is no one trusts them. You're a 25 year old trying to start a business, try going to a bank to borrow money. The bank manager will look at you and say, who is this kid? And what do you think you know? Trust building with the younger generation is an absolute fundamental ingredient for the future that we are trying to create. And I thank you for saying to them, we seed the ground. And it's now for us as development practitioners, organizations, international, regional, and local, to seize this moment and trust and invest in this younger generation to do exactly what you say they must do, creating movements, uh, even if they can't immediately mount political uh, positions. Prof, you talk about a radical concept 
of creating a model Africa country. I know where it comes from. It's born out of years of frustration that we keep putting the solutions on the table and nothing happens. I hope the world is listening and that Africa is listening. Maybe it's not just one country that we adopt, maybe several countries. I actually happen to believe that this is within reach, that this expression of our shared humanity that you put on the table can be constructed post COVID-19 in nations that have now seen the urgency of factoring in that humanity. And, but I think it's a moment to seize. I think it's an urgency that you have created here. We, we have a small window of opportunity why COVID-19 is putting us on our knees to accept that humility, that humble position and begin to reimagine what development looks like. Reimagine development, reimagine the political order, reimagine the social order, reimagine social contracting and what and bringing it uh, to the center of the table. And finally, uh, Prof, I want to say that your, your focus on women, on gender, I was really quite struck by that. When you said that if we continue to diminish half the world's population of women and girls, we brutalize our humanity and we diminish our humanity. That is such a powerful voice and a powerful message in the world of development practice where we struggle day in, day out to understand gender equality, to understand protecting women from domestic and other gender-based based violence that limits their opportunities, where we understand how to remove the, the cultural, the negative cultural practices that reduce the potential of women to rise as equals of men in securing and preserving our humanity. I'm very glad that you touched on that point. And it is, again, uh, a, a, an order for us as development actors to continue to work at it, um, as you said. So with that, um, Prof, I want to say your voice is authentic, is original. It may have other influences, but we perceive it as such great authenticity and originality uh, that we embrace. And I, I, I would like to continue to get um, pieces of this into our pot of trying to reconstruct or reset the world, um, not just the Africa, space, but the global space, just like you did in 1986. Africa's wisdom can become globalized. The world today is desperate for wisdom, whether it's at the leadership level or at the community level, the problems we face are huge. And Africa must also sign up to be a contributor to that wisdom that helps us reset the clock on the world. So thank you for being part of it. And I hope as Mark said, we can continue to tap into your Hakima uh, for, for the foreseeable future because we're in this together. And I can tell you there's a huge commitment from UNDP to champion what I know is uh, going to be transformational for the continent of Africa, for our world. And I want to thank you audience once again for being with us uh, for the duration, for being actively engaged and don't leave us. This is going to continue to 
to be streamed uh, on YouTube, online. The conversation has to continue. We're not done until it is done. Thank you, Mark, for brilliant moderation. Over back to you. Uh, thank you very much, Ahuna. And Professor, um, I wasn't going to ask any of the, I thought I'd finish with the questions, but I, I have to ask this question and get a quick, quick response. Elsie uh, uh, Atufwa has been watching this and so many other people have been watching this. I've never seen this type of reaction in a chat room of how people were excited by this, the, the richness of this conversation. But Elsie wants to know, uh, Professor, uh, you look so young, you look so strong and you look so full of energy. What is your magic? So oh, I answer that question in all kinds of ways. And uh, right now, that's your answer. Oh, yes. that's exactly, <laughs> you've been very tough. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor, and cheers to you too. Thank you very much, everyone else. Um, we look forward to jo you joining us again for another Hekima series. We're so grateful for your contributions. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. And I hope this is the beginning of the journey with you. That concludes the Hekima series. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. I think leave is here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oops. Mm -hmm.